Hi everyone and welcome back to Philosophy of Cognitive Science with me, Dr. Josh Redstone. So apologies for the lateness of this lecture. I've been feeling a little bit under the weather. Nothing serious, but it has put me uh, behind uh, just a little bit. So I apologize to all of you for that. Now, um, this lecture will probably be a teeny bit shorter than is usual. That is because I'm not going to go into many of the discussion boxes. You know, the boxes you find on certain of the pages of Clark's book like this. Uh, for this lecture today, I'm just going to direct you towards the relevant boxes. And this is in an effort so that, uh, you know, an effort to not fall uh, further behind. Okay, so that's the plan for today. I will refer you to the discussion boxes um, or the extra material boxes, whatever these boxes are really called, I'm not exactly sure. I will direct you to the relevant boxes during the relevant points of discussion during this lecture. So um, the plan for today is to go through the discussion section of chapter three, patterns, contents, and causes. Uh, of course, before we do that, we should probably have a quick recap of what we discussed last time on Tuesday's lecture. So let's get to a quick recap first, and then we'll dive into the three points of discussion that Clark raises in the discussion section of this chapter. Now, if you remember, on Tuesday's lecture, we covered the sketches section from chapter three of Clark, uh, Patterns, Contents, and Causes which in the syllabus I titled Rules and Representations. But as I mentioned last time, I'm not really sure if Rules and Representations captures everything uh, that we're talking about here. In particular, uh, it doesn't quite capture what we're talking about with regard to uh, mental causation or these kinds of patterns, objective patterns that may be abstract rather than concrete that Dennett seems to be talking about with his intentional stance. In any case, we began with the computational representational theory of mind. Now, granted, sometimes this is called the computational theory of mind. Sometimes it's called the representational theory of mind. Uh, sometimes computational representational. And sometimes we don't even talk about it as a theory. Instead, we talk about the symbol system that might subserve this computational uh, representational mind that some thinkers imagine us as having, such as Fodor's language of thought, right? That is a formal system, a formal symbolic system that works, um, at least theoretically speaking, very much like a Turing machine. And this is the sort of, I guess, if it's no longer the received view in the cognitive sciences, it was the received view for a long time, owing to the work of Alan Turing and, um, Herbert Simon, Alan Newell, and these figures. The computational representational theory of mind is also where we started to run into a lot of the mentalistic discourse or folk uh, discourse, you know, folk talk, folk psychology, that kind of thing. And we focus specifically on how Fodor sees it as vindicated, scientifically speaking, no less, because it seems to work. So our folk psychological apparatus, that that is the, the apparatus of our mental discourse, you know, talking about thoughts and beliefs and their power to explain behavior, the way they cause behavior in uh, ourselves and explain behavior in others, this apparatus matches the inner symbols and transitions between those symbol states. So um, this all works very well. Um, but one thing that we didn't really cover was where these symbols get their content from. I'm not going to go into that in too much detail today, but like I mentioned a moment ago, if you're curious about the two, I guess, dominant, um, dominant trains of thought on the matter or lines of thinking on the matter, you can check out box 3.3 in Clark chapter three. Uh, basically we have two different stories here, one in which context is fits by, uh, fixed by local properties in the system, and one in which content varies depending on the history of the system and the relations of the system to the environment, uh, or states in the environment, I should say. Of course, that's just the bullet point version of that box. I do encourage you to check it out, but we'll probably run into this further along in the course, so um, that's another reason I'm not going to get into it too much today. 
After we looked at the computational representational theory of mind uh, and folk psychology, we looked at eliminative reductionism. Eliminative reductionism says that we need to abandon our folk talk and our mentalistic discourse. You know, the apparatus or the folk terms or mentalistic terms we use with folk talk uh, need to be abandoned because they don't um, map onto any kind of uh, neat, discrete inner symbol system. So we should get rid of them. We should purge them from our explanatory toolbox of the world, just like we've gotten rid of other terms that turned out to be uh, incorrect in so far as they depicted the world. You know, we've gotten rid of terms like phlogiston. We've gotten rid of uh, Elan Vital. We've gotten rid of crystal spheres in the heavens. So maybe we need to get rid of beliefs and desires as well. And of course, this argument is due in large part to Paul Churchland, who's kind of, uh, along with his wife Patricia Churchland, are these, um, you know, champions of reductionism and identity theory and these kinds of things. And then we looked at some middle ground. We looked at Daniel Dennett's intentional stance. Um, now, both Fodor and um, both Fodor and Churchland agree that uh, these folk psychological terms would have to map onto something in the mind, in the head, as it were. Fodor thinks it maps neatly onto a symbol system, like language of thought. Uh, and of course, Churchland thinks it, there's nothing like that for it to map onto. It's all neural networks and firing patterns, and there's no neat, discrete symbols in the mind. Devitt says something different. He says, well, we don't need uh, our folk psychological apparatus to align perfectly with what's going on on the inside, whether there are inner symbols or whatever. And that's because mentalistic discourse actually picks out something that is abstract. It's objectively real, but it's abstract. You know, just like the equator is real. If you look on a globe of the Earth, you find the equator, but on the real planet Earth, it's not like we have an equator drawn on there, right? It's something in the abstract. Same with centers of gravity, you know, if you think of like... Um, a binary star system somewhere out in space, two stars orbiting one another. They orbit around a common center, a center of gravity. But it's not like that's extended in space or anything. The center of gravity is just the, the center of the gravity well, which is, uh, you know, we can understand in terms of the masses of these objects bending space-time and you know, we can use all kinds of cool Einsteinian visual analogies to understand this, but you're not going to be able to go out and, you know, touch the center of gravity or something like you can with this lamp. It's not concrete. It's something in the abstract. Then it says the same thing for um, the items in our mentalistic discourse, the folk apparatus that I've been talking about. By the way, if you want to take a look at some other examples of the kinds of patterns Dennett is talking about, you should check out box 3.4, which you can find on page 58 and 59 of Clark. Here, uh, a couple of these real, objective, albeit abstract patterns that are the kinds of patterns Dennett are, is talking about are illustrated here. And we have one example that uh, is very much in line with Zen and Politian's uh, example, where you see a car crash, you realize someone needs help, you dial 911, so on and so forth, and we can only really explain this chain of behavior and chain of thinking by using folk psychology. And the argument that Fodor and Politian make, of course, is that the reason this works is because our folk psychological apparatus really does map on to these neat inner mental items like beliefs and desires that have causal powers. Another example has to do with... Uh, John Conway's Game of Life. Now, if you are, again, uh, in cognitive science, uh, if that is your background, you will almost certainly have heard of this. If you come from a computer science background, you've definitely heard of this, and perhaps you've even heard of this if you're just a philosophy student as well. But the Game of Life is a very simple uh, computer program uh, about artificial life, where we have these simple rules that govern the behavior of these squares, these squares in a grid, which can be off and on. And the behavior of these squares according to these simple rules, um, well, it, the behavior can actually get quite complex throughout the system. Um, I will 
again, this it's not my purpose to go deep into this example today, but if you want to know more, I will find a link um, to some further reading about the game of life, or of course you can check out box 3.4. In any case, I just bring this up because these are meant to make uh, a little bit more concrete uh, the notion of these patterns that are objectively real, yet uh, exist, uh, that yet they exist in the abstract. So um, that is it for our recap. Why don't we pick it up on slide number three and talk about the first point of discussion, which is causes, reasons, and scattered causes. All right, so why this need for our folk talk to map onto the inner symbol structures, if there are inner symbol structures? Well, any kind of realism about the mental must treat mental states as causally potent. That is, it must treat mental states as if they have causal powers. And this is what Fodor does, right? Fodor, as we saw, is an intentional realist. He is a realist about the existence of these mental states and about their causal powers. So we need to show, if we are to vindicate folk psychology, that the mental state named by a folk term, a particular belief or a particular desire, for example, has causal powers. And of course, our vindication of folk psychology would therefore turn upon the causal powers of these inner states uh, in such a way that um, this causal power aligns with their semantic interpretation. <clears throat> Excuse me. So such a vindication turns on the causal powers of these inner states aligning with the content of the symbols or with the semantic interpretation of the symbols, right? The symbols mean something. So the causal potency of the symbols must align with, with, with the semantics. If we can show that, we can help to vindicate folk psychological discourse, you know, explaining behavior with folk talk basically. Now, of course, this is the picture that I tried to paint for you uh, at the start of our previous lecture. So I hope, by the way, that this doesn't seem like too much recap, but um, I don't know. This is all pretty abstract stuff, so maybe the more recapping, the better. Um, in any case, this is the picture I've been setting up in the class so far. The mind is a physical symbol system. Uh, it operates on uh, syntactic properties, while respecting the semantic content of those uh, symbol structures. So minds are like computers, right? This is symbolic AI. This is the physical symbol system hypothesis. This is the classic symbolic paradigm here. The mind is a physical symbol system and it operates on syntactic stuff, symbol structures and whatnot, uh, but it respects the semantic content, the semantics, even though it's blind to the semantics, right? So maybe this symbol system is like a language of thought, like Fodor imagines, or maybe something else is going on. You know, we're going to take a look at chapter four next week, and we're going to talk about neural networks, which don't use the same kinds of symbolic representations that we find in classical symbolic uh, intelligent systems. For example, in uh, connectionist research, research on artificial neural networks, we often talk about distributed, represent, uh, distributed representations or um, sub-symbolic representations. The representations and the symbols are there, but they're not neat little discrete items that we can pick out in the same way we could with the symbol structures for uh, the restaurant program that we looked at. So maybe something sub-symbolic is going on, but we're not gonna talk about that just yet. On a first pass though, um, if the mind is some kind of symbol structure that uh, works like a syntactic engine and operates only on the syntax but respects the semantics, uh, that seems pretty workable. Um, and we can see the appeal of this. We certainly have as we've proceeded through the first two chapters. And of course, I've talked a lot about the work of Fodor and Politian, who have been uh, probably some of the most staunch defenders of this kind of view. But what if we take a second pass? What if we take a closer look? Are there problems that arise? Let's see.
So as I kind of hinted at before, it's one thing to claim that mental states have causal powers. Um, it's another thing altogether to claim that there are so-called neat, uh, or the way I like to say discrete, internal items that correspond to mental states. That is to say, just as I mentioned a moment ago, maybe the mind works as a syntactic engine and there's some kind of language of thought, some kind of formal system in which we think. Um, or maybe it's not as neat as that. Maybe we've got some sub-symbolic representations going on. The brain is a big bunch of neurons all connected together, uh, after all. Well, not every, brain, not every neuron in the brain is connected to every other neuron in the brain, of course. That's a, an oversimplification. But the brain is basically lots and lots and lots of naturally evolved neural networks. So why should we expect things to be neat in the brain? Why should we expect our folk terms to map neatly on to whatever symbol structures are in the brain? And indeed, this is where Churchland has a problem with what Fodor is saying. But that concern aside, we also need to keep in mind that there are different kinds of causes. And this is important because if we're talking about mental states having causal potency, well, what kinds of causes are we talking about here? What kinds of causal powers uh, or causal effects do these mental states have, whether they're underwritten by discrete symbols or sub-symbolic symbols or distributed representations. Well, here's a few different kinds of causation. The first one ought to sound pretty familiar. Let's call it billiard ball type causation. You know, this is the kind of causation that David Hume used to like to talk about. The kinds of simple causal chains we can observe in everyday life, right? Um, my hand manipulates the cue stick in such a way that I strike the cue ball with the cue stick. The cue ball rolls and strikes the eight ball. The eight ball then rolls and lands in the corner pocket, right? Very simple. Does Fodor have something like this in mind? Well, um, Clark leaves this kind of open to interpretation, and while I've read my fair share of Fodor, I don't feel like I'm enough of an expert to really give you um, an authoritative answer here, but it certainly seems to me that thinkers like Fodor and Politian do have something that's um, neater rather than messier in the sense that I've been talking about so far in mind. Um, Fodor seems to think that there are discrete symbol structures in the language of thought, and these are manipulated according to rules, which are also represented as symbol structures, and thus we have mentation, we have thought, we have cognition. But this is not the only kind of causation we can talk about, right? There are typical or billiard ball type causal chains, to be sure, but there are also things that are a little messier. Uh, things that we might term scattered causes. What is a scattered cause? Well, a scattered cause is when lots of different disparate causal factors come together and produce some kind of causal effect. So where um, my billiard ball example is kind of like linear, scattered is distributed, right? It's all over the place. It's messy. Something like an economic depression uh, causing um, reduced employment rate, okay? That would be a scattered cause. Um, COVID-19 and all of the effects it is having on all of our lives is kind of like a scattered cause. It, we don't really treat COVID-19 as a single cause. Perhaps we do in everyday discourse, but really what's happening now, you know, multiple people getting sick and this has kind of effects that ripple through the system that is society. Um, so it's, 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 it's thousands and thousands of people feeling thousands and thousands of effects, which are causing many, many other subsequent causes. And it all turns into this messy pandemic uh, kind of situation where lots of people are staying home and the economy has downturned and so on and so forth. So economic depressions, uh, pandemics, these kinds of things we could talk about as perhaps scattered causes. Now, 
Clark notes here that it is tempting to treat mental states as scattered causes, and perhaps we can interpret Dennett as saying something like this too. Perhaps Dennett means something like a scattered cause when he's talking about mental states being abstracta rather than concreta. But we can even make a further distinction between scattered causes and another type of cause, an ungrounded cause. What is an ungrounded cause? Well, just to reiterate, a scattered cause is where we have distinct, disparate causal influences and we group them together because it helps us to make sense of something, like lower employment because of an economic depression. The economic depression is the cause of lower employment, but it's not like the economic depression is like the cue ball striking the eight ball and knocking it into the corner pocket. Uh, the uh, economic depression is this uh, big uh, cluster of tiny causal things that all together produce uh, lower employment rate. So those are scattered causes, but on grounded causes are causes that we attribute to try ex to explain robust regularities without reference to complex uh, physical um, causal influences. So. Um, that's a bit, um, geez, this is a bit abstract. I wonder if I can break this down any further. Well, I suppose the best way to break this down is to follow the line of reasoning that Clark pursues in this uh, chapter. And that is via same level, se excuse me, <laughs> that is via same level counterfactuals. So um, this is an approach that comes from Rubin. Um, and um, we do this all the time in day-to-day -day life and in philosophy. We engage in counterfactual reasoning. What are counterfactuals, you may ask? Counterfactuals um, describe what would be the case had such and such not happened or had such and such um, happened, right? We do this all the time, you know. If I hadn't, have, um, if I hadn't forgot my wallet at home, I wouldn't have been late for the bus because my bus passes in my wallet and if I had remembered to bring it with me, I wouldn't have had to run back home to get it, um, to get my bus pass and all of my money, right? So similarly in folk discourse, right? It starts to rain. So I take my umbrella with me when I leave the house. You're watching me, you say, oh, well, um, Josh clearly believes it's raining. Otherwise, he would not have taken his umbrella. Uh, it, this is Rubin's strategy for employing same-level counterfactuals. And in the case of folk discourse, it would work something like that. I might have a mental states and uh, a chain of instrumental reasoning and, and, and subsequent behavior that goes something like, you know, I look out the window, I see it is raining. It is raining right now, by the way, as I make this video. Um, it is raining. Uh, I believe it is raining. I form this belief based on what I perceive. So I desire to take my umbrella because I have a further desire to not get rained on. And that's why I take my umbrella. And you would say, if Josh did not believe it was raining, he would not have taken his umbrella. And you'd be right. And you would have also just engaged in counterfactual reasoning. Okay? So we do this all the time. Now, these counterfactual indicators can be plausibly explained by positing some kind of underlying scattered cause. But more radically, counterfactuals might directly establish causation, right? You don't have direct access to other people's minds, and arguably you don't have all that direct of an access, at least not the kind of access you probably think you do, to your own mind. So um, you can't really establish uh, an underlying scattered cause, even if it were the case that my, my mental representations are realized by these sub-symbolic distributed uh, representations that are really just, you know, neural firing patterns in my brain. So that's what my mental states are. They're these different neural firing patterns that token these different mental states. But you don't have a brain scanner when you're talking to me or observing my behavior, so you can't directly establish this causal, uh, this scattered, underlying scattered cause that way. So a more radical claim would be that your counterfactual reasoning about my taking my umbrella, your conclusion that 
Um, if I did not believe it was raining, I would not have taken my umbrella, and this is a radical claim, could establish uh, causal relations between my, my mental states uh, and, um, and my behavior. Or that is the causal potency of mental states to affect other mental states and to give rise to behavior, I suppose is a more precise way of putting it. So just to sum it up so far, we have scattered causes where we have distributed, discrete, disparate physical causes that all come together. And we group them together as a scattered cause because it helps us to understand the situation, right? Why is there unemployment? Well, uh, we've got an economic depression. The economic depression isn't like a single neat cause, like a billiard ball striking another billiard ball, but it helps us to understand. But if we can't get at those underlying disparate, separate physical causes, maybe counterfactual reasoning can directly establish those causal relations. But Clark is pretty emphatic that this is um, quite a radical proposal, and there are uh, some problems with it. For example, Clark thinks that it is odd to treat counterfactuals as if they are constitutive of causal facts. And the reason why is that if we do that, things are going to start getting real circular real fast. Uh, so Clark thinks that um, rather than treating counterfactuals as if they constitute um, causal facts, uh, facts about causation, um, we should assume that causal facts explain why counterfactuals hold. So in other words, you could explain my behavior well, Josh wouldn't have taken his umbrella if he did not believe it were raining with appeal to counterfactual reasoning. But the only way that the only reason that reasoning works is because um, there are other other causal facts at play. The problem with using counterfactuals to establish causal relations for mental states is that this approach assumes the existence of beliefs and desires and other mental states. And it uses, and this is the biggest problem, it uses beliefs and mental states to set up these same level counterfactuals. But then they use these same level counterfactuals to argue for the existence of the mental states. So if we want to avoid begging the question at some point here, we probably shouldn't rely on counterfactual reasoning to directly establish these causal relations when it comes to the mental. At least that is how Clark sees it. So the more plausible claim, if you haven't guessed already, for Clark, is that mental states just name scattered causes. They don't name ungrounded causes, which is what the counterfactual uh, stuff I was talking about was for. If we don't want to identify all these disparate uh, scattered physical causes and we try to establish causal relations by counterfactual reasoning, we are trying to establish an ungrounded cause. And we don't want to do that with the mental because of this risk of circular reasoning that we've just run into. So that's why Clark thinks the more plausible claim is that mental states simply name scattered causes. They have distinctive origins and reliable effects, so they're regular, and in establishing causality, regularity is pretty important. I think we can all agree on that. Therefore, we can treat scattered causes as items, right? Whether that's a mental state that's realized or implemented by thousands upon thousands of neurons firing in a particular way, or if we're talking about an economic depression that's caused by myriad uh, political, economic, social uh, factors, which in turn causes unemployment. We can treat that as a single item, even though it's scattered. Now, counterfactuals are somewhat helpful here because they can help us to highlight the regularities and justify our use of simple labels like belief that it is raining or economic depression to these scattered causal items. So we shouldn't use, Clark is saying, counterfactual reasoning to try and establish an ungrounded cause, but counterfactual reasoning might help us pick out these regularities, uh, these um, regularly, regularities in these scattered causes, I mean to say. 
Now, this is certainly not to say that the notion of scattered causes is completely unproblematic. We do have to be very careful about distinguishing genuine, albeit scattered causes, from cases where there is no causation at all. So, um, we have to be careful that we don't see what is not there. I suppose is, is, is one way that you could put this. You have to be careful to distinguish between something that may not be a neat, uh, discrete item, like one billiard ball knocking into another. You have to be able to distinguish um, uh, genuine but scattered causes, which are not neat like that, from cases where there is no causation. An example here takes us a little bit outside of the mental um, and cognitive science, but I'm, I'm thinking back, for example, to my previous class. I taught philosophy of the paranormal during the summer, and I talked a little bit about things like uh, astrology. You know, people may see the motions of the planets, the positions of the planets and the sun and the moon and so on and so forth in the sky at the moment of their birth as having causal powers over um, over their fate, right? Now, of course, in this lecture, what the heck? I'll link it down below in case you'd like to take a look. In this lecture, I was very careful to point out that um, we have not established uh, that there is anything causal going on here. In fact, we've, 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 we have a pretty good idea that astrology does not work, right? But if you were to say, um, try to establish uh, that as a scattered cause, right? The positions of all of the planets and where, which uh, part of the zodiac uh, the sun is in uh, when you're born, where Mars is, is uh, what planets are where, are they in retrograde, blah, 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 blah. If that actually had some causal influence on your life, that would be a scattered cause. But we know that astrology does not work. So, that's the kind of thing we need to be careful of, is um, saying there is causation here where there is no causation. So we have to distinguish between real scattered causes and cases where there is no causation, but which might look like cases of scattered causation, like the case of astrology. I didn't talk about it this way in that lecture, but again, if you're curious to take a look, link in the description. Uh, have a look if you like. So, um, on the plus side, um, scattered causes can help us to link causal claims and scientific descriptions of physical events. It helps to make things easier uh, that way for us. And that's great, because that's kind of what philosophy of cognitive science is about right now, to a great extent, is trying to give us the tools we need to talk about the things that we're trying to study, like mental states uh, and cognition and perception and folk psychology and all of this stuff, right? Um, and this notion of scattered causes is also compatible with research on connectionism. Uh, it's another point that Clark uh, emphasizes quite strongly here. Uh, connectionism is, of course, all about artificial neural networks and modeling using these uh, uh, connectionist networks. We're going to talk about connectionism next week, as I mentioned. Um, and it's also compatible with research on emergence, dynamic systems, and collective effects, all of which we're going to start getting to as we go deeper into Mindware by Andy Clark. And of course, um, there are lots of different accounts of causation. For a few different examples of ways we can think about causation, other than what I've discussed here, Check out Woodward's Manipulationist Account of, cogn of, of, um, of Causation, which you can find in Box 3.5, or you can check out uh, Program Explanations. That is due to Jackson and Petit uh, from their 1988 publication, which you can read a little bit about in Box 3.6 in Clark. Whatever the case is, we need to be as clear as possible about what we're claiming when we say that beliefs are real but that they don't correspond to anything really neat in the head. Dennett is, of course, very careful about doing this, and he treats these mental states, whatever's going on um, that our folk psychological apparatus describes, as abstracta. They are something that are objective and real, 
but they exist in the abstract. You don't find beliefs in the head, at least not as neat inner items in a language of thought, although Dennett doesn't outright deny that possibility. In any case, he does not treat mental states that way. He doesn't treat them as concreta, like perhaps Fodor or Churchland would do. But, Clark says here, maybe we can treat mental states as scattered concreta, and this would mesh very nicely with the research I just described, research in uh, connectionism, dynamic systems, so on and so forth. So, that is one thing that we need to be careful about. And notice, I'm not trying to convince you that it's one or the other. Indeed, this is something that you might like to explore in a future critical response, or perhaps in your essay. Are beliefs real? Or are beliefs something that are not useful and we should eliminate this word belief because it doesn't capture what's really going on in the head? We don't know yet. But whatever you argue for, you need to be as clear as possible about what you're arguing for. Dennett is very clear that he sees mental states as abstracta, but Clark says maybe we can treat them as scattered concreta. Maybe there's no problem with there. We'll probably come back to this issue um, like many other issues as we proceed through this class. So that is it for uh, that talking point. Why don't we move on to another point of discussion? This is point of discussion B, stances, and we'll pick up on slide number nine. So here we are back to our talk of stances. Now you'll remember from last time that one of the motivations behind Dennett's project with the intentional stance is to save mentalistic discourse or folk psychological discourse or folk talk, uh, as I call it in the slides, from Fodor's realism and Churchland's eliminativism by appealing uh, you know, to this stance that he thinks we take whenever we're confronted with a well-designed, reasonable system. So, um, on Dennett's view, of course, uh, this is more recap. Sorry for all the recap, by the way, everyone. Facts are, um, or rather, facts about mental states on Dennett's view are not facts about what is in the head or in the mind, necessarily. Um, facts about mental states are rather facts about our, our system's tendency, our, our cognitive system's tendency, to succumb to a certain interpretive approach where we treat it as a well-designed rational system. So for this reason, sometimes Dennett is called an ascriptivist, and his intentional stance is treated as a kind of ascriptivism. Because what are we doing with mental states? We are ascribing them to things. When we take the intentional stance, if I take the intentional stance because I'm interacting with you, a student of mine, perhaps, in an office hours meeting. Um, I adopt the intentional stance because you are a well-designed rational system, and I can make sense of your behavior, of all the words that are coming out of your mouth, of all the things you say, all the things you're doing. I can understand what you're doing and why you're doing it by adopting that stance and by ascribing you those mental states, right? Um, even just to bring it back to the simple toy example, right? Why did Josh bring his umbrella when he left the house? Well, he must have believed, or does believe, uh, that it is, is going to rain or it is, it is currently raining, right? So I'm ascribing the sense of belief that it is raining, right? Um, but to a realist like Fodor, this might sound kind of weird. A realist like Fodor, remember, thinks that the folk psychological terms we use really do pick out neat inner items, these neat uh, mental states, perhaps, uh, are, which are realized by these nice discrete symbols in a language of thought. The realist here is going to say to Dennett, you know, Dennett, Dan Dennett, <laughs> no. So a realist like Fodor here is going to say to Dan Dennett, hey, hang on a sec. My having mental states is not dependent, logically speaking, on someone else finding it useful to ascribe mental states for me. In other words, my belief that it is raining and my subsequent desire to take an umbrella does not depend in any way on someone ascribing that belief to me, right? To a realist, that's my belief. And I gotta admit, although I am a big fan of Dennett's project, I do see the worry here. Um, 
I per perhaps you could just uh, respond by saying that well, I ascribe mental states to myself. I take the the intentional stance toward myself. That is not all that unreasonable, I suppose, but I don't want to go into that response here. In any case, that's concern number one. My having mental states does not depend on someone else finding it useful to ascribe mental states to me. And moreover, people might usefully explain my behavior by ascribing me mental states that I don't actually have. So for example, um, I take my umbrella and somebody uh, ascribes the belief uh, to me that it is going to rain today. So it's not raining now when I leave the house, but I take my umbrella. Someone says, sunny out. Josh took his umbrella. He must believe it's going to rain later today. And that would usefully explain my behavior. But little do they know, I'm taking my umbrella for an altogether different purpose. Actually, I've taken my umbrella for an altogether different purpose. I am going to watch a paintball tournament and I don't want to get hit by any stray paintballs. So I'm carrying an umbrella that I can use as a kind of shield. Um, that's a strange example, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting way to show um, where this might start to break down, at least if you're thinking about this like a realist would, like a uh, photo or a politician or someone like that. And indeed, further, if we treat Dennett's position as merely a scriptivist, certain problems do arise. So Rudder Baker, for example, has argued that beliefs cannot be causally potent if they are just stance dependent. <clears throat> In other words, how can my mental states have causal power if they are ascribed to me, to me by other thinking agents who just find it reasonable to do that? Or even if I ascribe a mental state to myself, is that just some kind of story I make up for myself to explain my behavior? You know, I, I, did, I did this because I believed this and I thought doing this would accomplish this and, you know, so on down through the chain of instrumental reasoning. Um, if, if, um, if these beliefs are just stance dependent, they can't be causally potent. They don't have the causal power that we need them to have if we treat Dennett as merely a scriptivist. So maybe what we could do here is treat cause and effect relations themselves as stance dependent. Uh, this reminds me a little bit of what Immanuel Kant said about uh, the mind. Uh, you know, space and time are not out there in the world. They're um, modes of perception. And we have categories of understanding that help us make sense of the world. And a lot of what we uh, might think of as out there in the world is actually in here. It's kind of like that, although not exactly, but this would be at odds with Dennett's realism about physical phenomena. The, Dennett really does believe in cause and effect after all, so I don't think he would be wont to argue that uh, cause-effect relations are also stance-dependent in the way that um, uh, mental states are. So, um, because of all this, Rudder Baker accuses Dennett of being a little inconsistent, right? He's saying, well, mental states are stance-dependent, but if they're stance-dependent, they can't have causal power. But we could just treat causal power uh, or cause-and-effect relations as also being stance-dependent. But this is, this is all very inconsistent, so mm, there are problems here. But, um, okay, so that's one line of, one line of problems that Rudder Baker uh, accuses Dennett of uh, raising. What about Churchland and the eliminativists? They also see their own set of problems here. Church, Churchland and Dennett, of course, would agree that the neuroscience probably won't show there are neat, um, neat symbol structures in the mind that align nicely with our folk terms, with our mentalistic discourse, with our folk psychology apparatus. Churchland and Dennett agree on that. But Dennett still thinks that mental states name real abstracta. Remember, once again... Beliefs are not concrete things. Beliefs are not like states of the brain or this lamp. Beliefs are more like centers of gravity or the equator. So they're abstract things. On the other hand, Churchland thinks that these terms are just the concreta of a bad theory. They are like the crystal spheres or the luminiferous ether or phlogiston. 
right? They are they are naming concrete things which do not actually exist and that we need to get rid of from our um, from our explanation of the universe. For this reason, Dennett's defense of mentalistic discourse is a bit puzzling to Churchland. You can read about uh, this, I believe there's a quote on page 63 from Churchland. Why are we, no, I'm not going to read it directly, but basically why are we trying to uh, save this idea of belief and desire. We didn't do that with crystal spheres. We didn't do it with Elan Vital, the vital spirit. We didn't do it with phlogiston. Um, why are we doing it with mental states? We shouldn't. We should get rid of them, focus on what's going on in the brain. Then it is interested in what's going on in the brain, and he agrees that what's going on in the brain will not turn out to be a nice, symbolic, neat, discrete item in our in our mental um, economy, but he does think that uh, these abstracta name real objective patterns nonetheless, as we've seen. So what is the best response to these problems? Well, um, insist, and this is what Dennett does, that human mental states are not merely stance dependent. They are stance dependent, but not merely so. Why are they not merely stance dependent? Because when we take these stance, uh, stances and describe these mental states, we are actually picking out real, albeit abstract, patterns with causal potency. So they're just not concrete. They exist, but they're not concrete. They're abstract. So we just shouldn't expect that the um, mentalistic terms, uh, the things that mentalistic terms name, to appear as neat items in our mental economy, as I said a moment ago. Instead, mentalistic terms, uh, if we reinterpret Dennett, um, name scattered causes. They name either abstracta or scattered concreta that are perhaps distributed throughout the brain. This is, I believe, Clark's reinterpretation of Dennett. So, um, that is the best response. Uh, yes, Dennett says, uh, mental states are stance dependent, but not merely so. And that kind of saves, kind of saves the day for the intentional stance, if you like, because this is how we get the objectivity that we need um, in order for, for us to confront the, the criticisms of the, of the mental realists and of the eliminativists and so on and so forth. But... Again, we've always got to keep in mind, how do we know when a cause is real but scattered versus when a cause is not there at all? Um, how do we know when we have a real scattered cause, um, whether that is some kind of abstracta or scattered concreta in the brain? How do we know when we have that versus when we are just special pleading for folk psychology? We don't want to be doing special pleading here. Well, there are lots of things to keep in mind. Scattered causes, for example, need to figure into a wide range of predictions, explanations, counterfactuals, for example. Um, our scattered cause has to figure into a theory in the right kind of way, in the relevant domain. Um, it should help us to link theories together, theories of the mental, for example, or other types of theories across disciplines or across different levels of explanation. They should make these theories commensurate with one another. And this is, um, this is all stuff that uh, Clark just kind of leaves you with to think about at the end of this subsection. But once again, I don't mean to sound like a broken record here. We will re-encounter these themes again as we proceed throughout the class. But I will say for now, following Clark, folk psychology does seem to stand up quite well here. The problem with folk, psych uh, with folk psychology just seems to be this pesky lack of nice, neat uh, inner mental items uh, in our mental economy. Um, maybe we think in a language of thought, but if we do, um, maybe what we're maybe the language of thought is. Um, fixed at a higher level of abstraction than, than uh, we should be looking at. You know, Maybe uh, there is a language of thought, but it's not as neat as Fodor imagines. And maybe there's scattered concreta and distributed representations uh, in the neural networks that are in all of our brains. I would imagine that something like this tur turning out to be the case. Or rather, I should say, I would not be surprised if this is where the consensus is going. And it seems to me that that is where it's going, away from the classical picture and towards a more 
connectionist inspired, um, embodied, uh, extended mind kind of way of looking at things. Anyway, we don't want to go too far down that rabbit hole yet. So let's wrap it up uh, for the stances point of discussion. And let's move on to our final point of discussion, uh, which is, I believe, 3.2c, upgrading the basic believer. Here we're going to talk um, even more about Dennett's intentional stance. All right, so in part one of this lecture, on Tuesday's lecture, we learned all about the intentional stance, and we learned that it, it, it can explain the behavior of all kinds of systems, as long as they are well-designed and uh, rational systems. Now, this uh, surely seems to work for humans. Um, it seems to work uh, for animals. We apply the intentional stance to animals. We apply it to artifacts as well, cars, computers, whatnot. Uh, we can even imply, apply it to natural phenomena, like the uh, lightning rod installer at Daniel Dennett's farm did, uh, which I explained in the previous lecture. But if we say that these abstracta, these mental states, are scattered causes, which is how Clark kind of interprets Dennett, this seems to undermine the inclusion of the myriad different things that we include in our True Believers Hall of Fame. True Believers Hall of Fame is, by the way, uh, Dennett's term. True believers are systems that succumb to the intentional stance, right? Systems that are well-designed and rational that we can ascribe mental states to when we adopt the intentional stance. So, this is all to say that we can interpret, if we want, Dennett as being a realist about scattered causes. So um, the abstracta are perhaps rather uh, scattered concreta, as I talked about a moment ago. But if we do this, this would undermine the inclusion of many of the things that we include in this category of uh, believers, right? This category of well-designed, reasonable systems that can be understood by taking the intentional stance and ascribing mental states to it. However, Dennett tries to be very, very clear here. He is not trying to um, obscure the important differences between uh, human beings and um, you know, artifacts like computers and cars or natural phenomena like lightning or animals or robots or anything else for that matter. Dennett is not trying to downplay or deny the differences between these different kinds of believers, right? Instead, Dennett is actually very interested in these differences, and you, you kind of get this if you read his writings, um, which I highly recommend all of you do. Dennett's writings are really fun to read. They're difficult to understand sometimes, but, um, you know, Dennett makes it fun. Um, so, yeah, just, just, a, just a little tip for you. As I said, Dennett is not trying to downplay these differences. He is quite interested in these differences. And he actually uh, depicts more complex believers as uh, systems that involve a kind of um, cascade of upgrades to simpler minds. I'll try to explain what I mean by following the examples that Clark uses at this point in the chapter. So at the bottom of this hierarchy, we have uh, smart agents. What are agents? What is a smart agent? Well, they are smart, uh, yet simple. They're smart insofar as their behavior respects these hardwired goals. But the systems themselves are very simple, almost like reflex systems. Uh, or very simple production rules, right? So here, a smart agent would be something like a thermostat, right? Uh, you set the thermostat at, um, I don't know, 27 degrees Celsius, and it works such that if the temperature is below 27 degrees Celsius, the thermostat turns on, and if it is above, it turns off. Easy. So that's a smart agent. And uh, that's an artifact, uh, an artifactual example, but there are natural examples. Amoebas, you know, uh, simple one-celled life forms that go around devouring other one-celled life forms. Very cool stuff. Amoebas are very neat, but they don't have brains or nervous systems. 
They're more like a collection of these little tiny microscopic uh, cellular machines that work reflexively. Um, so their behavior is hardwired, hardwired, and it respects goals. But they're not—they're not like us. Um, they're not, you know, smart and complex like humans with our big brains are. But the further up this hierarchy of complexity that we go, we find additional design innovations the further up we go. And these innovations allow creatures to pursue more complicated goals. These uh, increasing levels of complexity also allow us to maintain increasingly complicated relations between ourselves and the world. Um, and these are innovations, by the way, that Dennett sees as having evolved. So Dennett's not really an evolutionary psychologist at all, but he is interested in the evolution of minds, whether we're talking about the human mind or very simple smart agents like amoebas. He's interested in how evolution has produced thinking systems, how, how evolution has produced these true believers. So, um... We've evolved kinds of innovations like mental images, like speech, like the capacity for self-reflection and metacognition. Um, so that's why Dennett says thinking, our kind of thinking. And I'm quoting from uh, Dennett's book. Um, Dennett says, and this is quoted on page 66 in Clark, Dennett says thinking, our kind of thinking, had to wait for language to emerge. Um, this is one of those design innovations that uh, enabled further, uh, for more, uh, more complicated thinking to emerge in human beings. And we don't just have these design innovations. Um, again, they're designed um, not in the intelligent design sense, but in the blind watchmaker sense, right? Designed by natural selection over many millions of years. Um, uh, this cognitive machinery uh, has allowed us to be more, uh, to, or to engage in mu much more complex types of mental behavior than simple smart agents. So, um, we also don't just rely exclusively on our cognitive machinery either. We also offload cognitive tasks into the environment. We count on our fingers, for example, right? Uh, we don't just count on our fingers, we make lists, we write books, we label things. Um, there's all kinds of little cognitive tools at our disposal that we use to make our own um, thinking, our job of thinking, a little bit easier. So there's this kind of cognitive offloading into the environment, which can happen in many, many different ways. It can, it can be a kind of epistemic action, like what expert Tetris players use, um, it could be as simple as writing things down in a notebook or counting using your fingers, right? There's many ways we can do this. Culture is, a, is probably the biggest example, though. Think of how much knowledge is offloaded into a culture, right? It, what's written down, what's stored in libraries, what's on the internet, all of that knowledge out there in the world, such that if there was some disaster and all of that knowledge were taken away, we'd be in trouble. We'd be back to the Stone Age, right? Um, so I guess uh, all of this is to say that Dennett should absolutely not be read as trying to downplay the differences between humans, complex entities like humans, and simpler entities like amoebas by promiscuously using the intentional stance. Um, but despite all of these differences in complexity, which Dennett is not trying to downplay, again, he's very interested in, in these differences, but despite these differences, we have something in common. The amoeba, the thermostat, the human being, the robot, the cat, whatever you want to talk about, whatever intentional system or true believer you want to talk about, they are all well-designed systems that pursue goals or behave intentionally or act according to reasons. Therefore, there is no clear line of demarcation between what Dennett calls a true believer, uh, a, a, a well-designed rational system that we can make sense of by, imply, uh, by adopting the intentional stance, and non-believers, things that don't really have mental states. Um, 
Really, it's just a bag of design innovations that has been produced by millions of years of evolution. And our bag of design innovations is going to be more or less shared with the bag of design innovations that amoebas have or that robots have or whatever. And as I've said before, Dennett also doesn't think there is any reason to argue that each ascribed mental state has to correspond to a neat inner item like a symbol structure in the language of thought. Now, of course, we're still left with a lot of questions here. Questions about the status of folk psychology and the fate of folk psychology, but we are not going to solve those in this lecture, nor in this class. This is likely to remain a lively debate for years to come, and perhaps it'll, it, it, is that, it is a debate that you will make some contribution to as a future philosopher of mind or cognitive scientist. Who knows? In any case, that is all I have for you today. Remember, I have not covered the discussion boxes in detail, so um, all of the discussion boxes I've directed you towards, I, I do think it would be very helpful for you to check them out on your own time as you're reading or rereading this or uh, watching this lecture, just to kind of shore up some of what I've been saying and to try to make some of what I've been talking about a little bit more concrete. So today we've covered a lot more considerations concerning mentalistic discourse. So we've wrapped up chapter three and next time we're going to turn to chapter four. Chapter four is of course all about connectionism. Uh, connectionism includes artificial neural networks, uh, parallel distributed processing, a radically different computational paradigm than what we've been looking at so far. So get ready for something different next week. And of course, I look forward to reading all of your critical responses as well. Those are going to be due Monday at 11.59 p.m. So if you have any questions, uh, do reach out to me and I will try and answer them as quickly as I can. But that is all for now. Uh, bye for now, everyone, and I'll see you next time. Take care.